16th of July, 2011. It's about 2pm on a rainy Saturday afternoon in Edinburgh, Scotland, and after an hour of exploring the city in the cold, myself and Jonathan Tisdale find a quiet street to get stoned through an empty Coca-Cola can in. Jono takes the can and flattens it on one side and punctures tiny holes into the flat side using a pen in order to burn the buds through. He then takes out his house keys and punches a large air hole in the side to be covered by our thumbs as we light the bud and then let go when drawing in the smoke which acts as a vacuum. Jono is from Rotorua, New Zealand, and I guess this is a technique he learned growing up there. After smoking by a dumpster in this leafy inner suburban street, we decide to head to a nearby science museum and take full advantage of our altered state. The museum itself is a little hazy. I remember walking inside two large green tubes with a rickety wooden bridge running between them. The dark surroundings are lit up to give off the optical illusion of a swirling kaleidoscope. I also remember looking out a top story window at the grey rainy streets of Edinburgh. Finally, I remember us taking photos of ourselves through a mirror feature that creates the illusion of several copies of the person looking through it, and another which creates the illusion of the person's head seemingly decapitated. Just after 3pm we decide to leave the museum. As we're walking down the wet streets of Edinburgh, I have an idea in my relaxed stone state that we should get on the train and head west to Glasgow City for the evening. Jono lights up at this suggestion and says, That's a great idea, Pete, in his Kiwi accent. So we find a nearby internet cafe and book a cheap youth hostel in Glasgow for the, for the night. We then head to Edinburgh Waverley train station arriving just before 4pm and purchase return train tickets valid for 24 hours. After a 30 minute wait, we board the train en route to Glasgow Queen Street Station. On the train there are families everywhere and I begin to feel paranoid. This is the first time I've been stuck this close to straight thinking people whilst in an altered state of consciousness not only induced by alcohol. I feel the judgement bestowed on the two of us young men by the Asian lady with three kids sitting opposite us and the old couple sitting across from us. Alas, after 50 minutes of uneventful yet blissful green Scottish countryside and highways, we arrive at Glasgow Queen Street Station. We walk through the comparatively dry yet solemn streets underneath the concrete buildings and grey skies of Glasgow City, West Scotland. Following our map to the youth hostel, which is about 30 minute walk through the marketplace and urban centre. Glasgow has a much larger feel than Edinburgh, and the people definitely seem more primal. More down to earth than those Edinburgh fuckers, as one Glaswegian lass will elegantly describe to me later on this evening. I have a sense that I will have to be a little more careful with how I carry myself here. Around 6pm we arrive at the youth hostel. It's one large sky-rise building in the street. Lots of floors laid out in dormitory-like fashion and stacked on top of each other. Rooms of bunk beds. After checking in at the lobby, we take the elevator all the way up to our floor. Our room has no other occupants but us. The room itself has nothing but a bunk bed and a big round table next to the window overlooking the streets of Glasgow and I see just how high up we are. Showtime. It's just after 6.30pm so we decide to go find a liquor store and bring back a bottle of something heavy to the hostel and begin drinking. We walk the streets for half an hour looking for a bottle shop but are unable to locate one. We keep walking and soon we find ourselves back in the heart of the city. Due to the distance back to the hostel and time passing quickly, we decide to hit a bar instead for pre-drinks. At 7pm we find a hotel with a cocktail bar at street level. We head in. The place looks classy with lounge music playing. There are two young people working behind the bar, a guy and a girl both dressed in expensive-looking formal attire. We order a couple of spirits and sit at the bar. 
Jono strikes up a conversation with the young man serving us. He is a 24-year-old Australian. I ask where he is from in Australia. He says Melbourne. I ask how long he has been in Glasgow. He says two years. After an hour of drinking, I start to feel a buzz. The jazzy cocktail bar music is sounding good, and I feel fully relaxed. The Aussie approaches us again and tells us that he is knocking off work at 9pm and is going out to meet friends at a nightclub called Sub Club. He invites us to join him. We ask him what the club is like. He says the club has the largest, largest sound system in the Northern Hemisphere. We accept his offer. I go to the bathroom and when I come back, Jono says to me in his thick Kiwi accent, Pit, I've sussed us out two pulls from the Aussie. I ask Jono what he means. He is saying that he just bought two ecstasy pills off the Aussie bartender for us to take at the club. I am unsure about taking them. I tell Jono I've never taken ecstasy before. He tells me not to worry and he will drop it with me. I resist and ask him what the chances are of overdosing. Bro, I've taken hundreds of pulls. You've got nothing to stress about. I am a little nervous, but Jono instills confidence in me, saying that it will be a worthwhile experience. I agree to try it. It's 9pm and the sun is just going down. The sun goes down much later and rises much earlier at this time of year in Glasgow. The Aussie closes the bar up and shouts us a free drink whilst we sit. After completing his closing procedure... The Aussie hangs his bartender apron up and knocks off. He tells us to follow him and we'll go to the club. I'm feeling good at this point. The last couple of hours spent drinking at this classy hotel bar has put me in a relaxed mindset. We exit the bar and walk with the Aussie through the lit up streets of Glasgow illuminated beneath the fading red glow of the sun in the night sky. Everywhere I look, people are going for a night out on the town. There is a buzz in the air. The women are dressed provocatively, and I see one girl with a pink leather short skirt pulled all the way up her thighs and a button-down white dress shirt tucked into the skirt, exposing a large portion of her fake tits. Her face is covered in makeup and fake tan with hot pink lipstick to match the skirt. We finally arrive at Sub Club. After lining up with the Aussie, he spots some of his friends and goes off with them after they greet him with hugs. They disappear into the club straight past security. Evidently, one of the Aussie's friends knows the bouncers. That's the last we ever see of the Aussie. We get to the front of the line and show our passports. The bouncers give us a nod and we head in. We come to a tiny desk just inside the doorway to the left where a beautiful dark-haired girl with blue ribbons in her hair is sitting. We pay her a cover charge of ten quid each and get a stamp on our hands. We head down the hallway and through the, to the club. It seems large in size with lots of open dance floors. We spot the bar on the left-hand side of the red, dimly lit club and head straight for it where we purchase some vodka lemonades. We then sit down at a booth in the wall back on the opposite side of the room. Jono decides it's time to drop the pills. I am nervous. Alas, I do not want to freak out and I can tell Jono is slightly amused by my anxiety towards the subject. He hands me the pill discreetly under the table of the booth. It's, ti it's a tiny purple tablet with what looks to be the outline of a dolphin engraved in the centre. We both drop. I decide it's too late to worry now and try to be positive. I sit back and drink my vodka lemonade and enjoy the music that is beginning to pick up in intensity. I ask Jono how long it will take to kick in. He says roughly 45 minutes. After sitting in the booth and watching Sub Club get busier, I check the time. It's been 40 minutes and I still don't feel anything. I break the silence with Jono as we've both just been sitting there without talking, overpowered by the increasingly loud drum and bass music. I yell to Jono that I don't feel anything. He assures me to just wait. I look down at my drink and finish it. I take another look around the club and then POW! Suddenly my vision zooms in and becomes fully focused. 
Time speeds up drastically, including the music, which has also risen a half step in key. My body feels like an old VCR tape and somebody has just hit fast forward on the remote. I am absolutely elated. I look at Jono and he looks at me and I can tell by the sweat pouring down his red face that it has hit him too. Whoa! I yell towards Jono at the top of my lungs. Jono keeps it cool as he smiles and nods in agreement, mouthing the word yip. I feel great! I then shout at the top of my lungs. Weeks later, when reflecting on the night, Jono would mock my inexperienced reaction at this moment and laugh as if I was so naive. He then looks up at me and says, Let's go. We both throw ourselves off the seats, out of the booth, and into the action with absolute intensity and enthusiasm. We have no idea what we are, where we are going, but we both have total commitment to seizing whatever heavy moments the night has to offer in the way of music, girls, and people in general, as we are both, after all, foreigners, and this is our one and only night in this strange city. We march straight to the back of the club, and it's there I find out why the club is so loud, and indeed, why the club is called Sub Club. The back wall of the club stretches wide and is entirely covered in subwoofer speakers for wallpaper, each blasting heavy hypnotic bass tones which shake the entire club and also my chest. I follow Jono as we power walk in zigzag motion through the crowds of intoxicated sub-club patrons, all the while I can't help but lick my guns and blink my eyes continuously, <sighs> almost as though my body can't keep up with the speed that my mind is running at. These unusual facial motions feel like outward manifestations of my own internal computer lag. We get a couple of drinks at the bar and then go to the pisser to splash water on our burning faces. It is in here that I see myself in the mirror for the first time since the pill kicked in and I notice that my pupils have almost entirely taken over the colouring of my eyes. I laugh hysterically and point it out to Jono, whom this exact same phenomena has occurred to. After leaving the pisser, we head outside the club, which at this point is beginning to reach full capacity, and the music is at maximum sub-club volume. We light up a smoke and note the line to get into this place is out the door and around the corner. I double-check with the bouncer that our stamps mean we can get back in, and he nods. At this point, with a cigarette in hand... I begin to power walk with my chest pushed out enthusiastically around the corner and down a road disappearing darkly beneath a large building stretching above the street. The road becomes darker the further away I get from the club, but the energy is bursting through at triple capacity and I simply must keep moving. Sensing I have gone a little too far, I decide to turn back to the club as I feel like talking to somebody, anybody who will listen to how great I feel. Everything is happening so fast, and in no time at all I am back at the club. Jono is nowhere to be seen, but I find an attractive bunch of young Glaswegian ladies and begin to strike up a conversation. One of the girls boosts my ego by telling me that she can't talk to me because I am too beautiful. Standing with these girls, I talk and talk and talk. I am in no control of what I am saying and not even conscious of what we are talking about, but I am, I am watching it all unfold in an almost out-of-body experience. I have these girls all surrounding me in fits of laughter. I tell the Scottish girls that this is my first night in Glasgow and that I am leaving in the morning, but I already love it so much more than Edinburgh. Fuck Edinburgh, stay here, announces one of the Glaswegian lasses. Glaswegians are more down to earth than those Edinburgh fuckers. Out of nowhere I get chatting with a girl with jet black hair and tanned olive skin wearing a black one-piece dress with a puffed out short skirt over the top of fishnet stockings. She is curvy and has a very pointy face, pretty pointy face, with beautiful green eyes. She has a much different look and a more foreign accent than the Glaswegian girls. I tell her I love her accent and ask her where she is from. She tells me she is from Spain. After making small talk for what feels like two hours or five minutes simultaneously, 
We have our tongues down each other's throat. It's cold outside the club now and it's getting late. Next thing I know we are in a cabin rude to the hostel making out in the back seat. When we arrive, I bring her through the lobby with no trouble and up the elevator where we alternate between talking and kissing. Everything is still in fast forward for me. We get into the room and within seconds we are both in my bed. I realize I don't have a condom and in a brash decision I put on my pants without my shirt and run to the elevator at the end of the hall only to realize I have forgotten my elevator card. I am too buzzed to turn back now so I enter the stairwell. I run all the way down to the bottom of the stairs reaching the lobby without breaking a sweat. My plan is to ask the first person I see if they have a condom, and may I please have it as I have company upstairs. Luckily or unluckily for me, I encounter walking through the main entrance of automated glass doors, a large group of young British lads walking in all, walking in all pissed as nits and shouting at the top of their lungs in football chant-like manner. There has to be at least 20 to 30 of these guys, and the lobby staff don't dare try to contain them. Sticking out like a sore thumb with no shirt on, I try to quietly confide in one of them on the far side for a rubber. What, mate? He shouts. I was wondering if you wouldn't happen to have a condom by any chance, I say with a wry smile on my face. Suddenly he turns around. Lads, lads, lads! Has anyone got a rubber? This boy's got a bird upstairs. They all cheer hysterically, and one of them opens his wallet and produces a condom in bright green packaging. As I reach towards it, one of the other members of the group steps forward and holds the lad with the condom back with his hand. Wait, 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 he shouts. If this lad wants a rubber... He's got to do 60 push-ups first or he's not getting one. The whole crowd of them erupt with laughter and cheer. I try to convince them that I can't do it and to just give me the rubber, but this only riles them up even more. They all shout no and demand that I do the push-ups or I'm not getting it. All right, all right, I'll do it. They all cheer. I manage to bargain the number of push-ups down to 40, so I drop down to my chest in the lobby of the YHA with no shirt or shoes on and begin to pound out push-ups, and the whole crowd of these 40-plus English football hooligans begin to count in the same manner in which they were chanting as they entered the hostel. Other hostel residents are passing by and the hostel staff dare not interfere. I barely make it past 20 before my body begins to shake. This amuses the crowd even more. I finally fall to the ground with failure at around the 20 mark. They all laugh hysterically. I accept failure and embarrassment as they begin to walk off. Suddenly the lad with the green condom approaches me and gives it to me anyway. He congratulates me on a solid effort and tells me that I deserve it. I sprint back up the stairwell and finally make it to back to my floor, which would have killed me, but I am still exploding with energy. I can't get back into the room without my card, so I begin knocking for the Spanish girl to open the door, and she finally lets me in. She tells me she fell asleep waiting for me and asks where I've been. Before I can explain what happened with the English guys, we have our tongues down each other's throats again. Lying on her side, facing me, she takes off her underwear and tosses them on the ground and proceeds to usher my cock into her cunt. All this without even taking her black dress off. We go at it for a good half an hour, but I can't come due to my intoxication when all of a sudden the door flies open and in bursts Jono with about three to four random lads. He takes a look at me and then looks at the Spanish bird with his huge dilated pupils and laughs hysterically. He then apologizes for interrupting and tells us to keep going and that he's just getting some glasses for the lids pit. He takes four glasses from the kitchen and they all leave out the door. We keep going and the last thing I remember is the Spanish bird on top of me. I wake up with the sun beaming through the window. For a minute I have no idea where I am. 
I look over and see the Spanish bird asleep next to me, still wearing her black dress and fishnet stockings. Then it clicks that this vivid yet hazy sequence of events actually happened and I wasn't dreaming. She wakes up and we chat for a while and she reminds me where in Spain she is from and how long she is in Scotland for, etc. After a while, I feel the need to get my head straight and ask her to leave. It would, be, it would be better if you left now because we have to go soon and I don't want them to realize you stayed here without checking in because you could get in trouble, I explain. She nods and gets out of the bed and then she reaches for her underwear off the floor and slides them back on. Do you walk of shame? She inquires. No, 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 I assure her. At this point, my brain is completely depleted of all resources usually summoned for social etiquette, and I don't even attempt to make cordial plans to see her again. However, with one last effort at decency, I offer to escort her out of the premises. She doesn't really seem that phased, and she tells me it's fine and lets herself out. I think, of, I think about her walking through the lobby of the hostel, and then through the streets of Glasgow in broad daylight, past construction workers and townsfolk in her black dress and fishnet stockings of the night, with her hair all puffed out, and I feel bad. I then realise she thought of all of this before I did but at the same time I feel relieved that she left without too much trouble. I then see that Jono is in the bun <laughs> bunk bed above, passed out. I check the time and it's 10.30am. We have to check out now and make it back to Glasgow Queen Street Station on foot in an hour in order to board the train to Edinburgh. I wake Jono up and he laughs hysterically at the night. <laughs> that just passed. What a fucking night, Pit. We trade stories with each other about what happened. It turns out he went drinking back at someone's house from the club. I assume they came all the way to the YHA to get glasses for a bottle they bought. He says the house was miles away, yet he walked all the way back to the YHA because he was so buzzed, but that he doesn't remember going to bed. We pack our things and leave, handing our keycards back to the front desk and manage to talk our way out of paying a late checkout fee. We pass through the same lobby and automated front doors where I encountered the football hooligans only hours earlier. The streets outside look rough. There are some scary characters lurking in hooded jumpers in the marketplace on the way back to the train station. The Glasgow streets are steaming in morning sunlight. The grey sky reflects the spilled drinks and vomit puddles that lie in evidence to the wild Saturday night having just passed. I still feel buzzed from the pill, yet very tired at the same time. My jaw is in pain from the whole night of clenching it, which I am still doing now. We barely make it to the train station after a horrible long walk through the city, but manage to get our tickets printed only minutes before departure. We board our fare at 12.30pm and don't say a word to each other the entire way back. My brain feels scattered but fully awake. I look at both my train tickets from yesterday and today and decide to keep them as a testament to this memorable weekend. We arrive back at Edinburgh Waverley and walk through the city. We cross a large park that features a miniature golf course in the centre called the Meadows. I am living in a sandstone flat on a street just off the south end of the meadows in an area called Marchmont. Jono is living further south of Marchmont in an area called Carlton where he is working as a groundsman. He reveals to me that he has to work today. This baffles me. I ask him how he could possibly work in this state. He laughs and shrugs it off with little care. We arrive at my flat and neither of my two flatmates are home. We proceed to smoke weed out of a can again, breathing it outside my living room window as Jono tells me this is the best thing to do after taking pills. He then says goodbye and leaves the flat. I go to my room, which is more like a cupboard in the wall, only fitting a bed. I close the door and climb in bed. 
I then stare at the ceiling in pitch darkness, wide awake for over an hour. I still, I'm still feeling buzzed and clenching my jaw. I think about the science museum the night before, the day before, and I realize in disbelief that less than 24 hours has passed since we left that place. I pass out and sleep until late at night. Upon waking, I wonder how the hell Jono worked all day on the grounds. I then remember Jono telling me that he's had hundreds of pulls, and I realize that he is a 23-year-old seasoned veteran compared to a 19-year-old rookie me.